Should we be concerned about the dangers of artificial intelligence? We're all familiar with the sci-fi trope of the robot that somehow gains sentience, begins to question the goals imposed on it by its programmers, and decides to overthrow its human masters, ushering in the new robot age. This sort of anxiety is very deep-seated in the culture. It comes out in philosophical discourse, comes out obviously in art, in pop culture. Um, it's tempting to simply reject that as complete nonsense. You'll notice that in this uh, sci-fi trope, an artificial general intelligence, a generalized problem solver that is more intelligent or can solve problems better than any human actor, that is conflated with artificial sentience and artificial mind. And they don't necessarily have to go together. You know, you can get a system that can solve uh, the vast majority of problems posed to it better than any single human actor. You can have that without having that machine being conscious. Uh, people will kind of downplay the relevance of machine learning algorithms or specialized AIs. And I think people focus too much on what individual problems individual AI systems can solve. Um, you know, when we have the sci-fi trope in mind, we're thinking of a mind, basically, that is more powerful than us, that subsumes the human domain within its aegis. And that's because we're mapping that onto like archaic archetypes of the monster, you know, basically. Um, but that's not the reality. The reality is that the threat of AI isn't what AIs can do in isolation. It's not their individual capacities for problem solving. It's the cybernetic hybrid human AI superorganism that's formed that is the real threat. And that's what you have in the corporate world. That's what you have in elite nation state actors. We have a handful of very large corporations and states that apply computer tracking and AI workflow optimization, uh, AI inventory planning, you know, making decisions about how much product eventually ends up on the shelves. AI is making those decisions in large part. You know, a variety of points along the production chain are increasingly determined by AI decision making. And to compete, you have to use these systems. Um, the kind of 1.0 version of this was just basic computer tracking um, not using AI workflow optimization, which is more emerging now and is already extremely significant for big players. But, you know, just like UPS, for example, is kind of a paradigmatic case. They very early on began chip, uh, chipping their, their packages, tracking what's going on in the warehouse, tracking delivery times, getting a ton of quantitative metrics to then make really intelligent decisions about routing about promotion decisions, hiring, firing decisions. You know, they had all this data and they had to use computers to process it even then um, in the 90s when they were really at the forefront of this. Um, but now with AI, that whole process is just kind of taken to the next degree. Um, Walmart was an early adopter of this kind of computer tracking. Amazon, obviously. Um, UPS, actually, a big part of their business became not just being a package carrier, but implementing, uh, being contracted out to other corporations to implement their kind of computerized logistics systems. So it's not about what AI, a single AI does. It's about how AI shapes the way that human beings plan and organize and communicate. Clearly, we see this at the kind of 
uh, user end, when we deal with YouTube, when we deal with Facebook, etc., the information that we see is filtered by AI. Therefore, necessarily, AI is shaping the direction of our discourses. That's simply happening, right? This concern of a an impersonal technology subsuming formerly human domains within its aegis and determining them from the top down in various ways. That's just happening. Right? These billion trillion dollar corporations and nation state actors, these kind of hybridized cybernetic behemoths are duking it out on the world stage. And unless you subsume yourself within one of these systems, work for one of these systems, or somehow found one of these systems, you're just not relevant in terms of world history. That's already the way it is, right? We don't have to wait for the robot to become sentient to be concerned about an AI takeover. AI is already indispensable if you want to really be a global player. You have to form hive minds that are integrated from the bottom up and from the top down with AI systems, tracking, computer tracking. Um, <laughs> and the goal setting in that process is largely, at least in the corporate world, determined by the logic of capitalism, right? Legally, uh, corporate management has a fiduciary obligation to shareholders. It has to increase the bottom line of the shareholders. Um, and so necessarily these AI hybrid behemoths are setting their goals in terms of making certain numbers go up. They are not looking at the broader environmental impact. Um, AI myopic goal setting in AI is really the problem. Uh, the main problem I think of AI as a whole. Um, Nick Bostrom in his book, Super Intelligence, talks about the example of like a, a paperclip optimizing AI system where, you know, some company that manufactures paperclips builds an AI to optimize their workflow and, you know, make as many paperclips as possible. And because that's the only goal that the AI has in mind, so to speak, it uh, concludes that the way to make the most paper clips is to melt down all of the matter found on Earth uh, and you know turn turn everything into paper clips. Kind of a nanoscale gray goo concept, but instead of nanobots, you turn everything into paper clips. That's myopic goal setting, right? <laughs> and how uh, goals are determined for AI systems and how AI systems can be led to modify their goal structures is kind of this is why ai researchers have to work with cognitive scientists and with philosophers and that's happening you know like if you look at big universities a disproportionate number i would say of the philosophers on staff are philosophy of mind and philosophy of science the kinds of researchers that can contribute to developing AI. Um, and it's really like the big game in town at the moment. Um, like maybe there are ways of increasing human productivity. Maybe there are ways of integrating with one another through organic means to a greater extent and becoming competitive, you know, without all of this computer tracking and like the techno behemoth, uh, dominating things but uh you know such methods are not forthcoming <laughs> you know we don't know exactly how to do that it seems like we're determined to fall into these ai hybrid hive minds <clears throat> and that's just it uh so should we be concerned with the threat from artificial intelligence uh, yeah, <laughs> obviously, of course, it's uh, already shaping our discourses, the way that we do business, it's shaping how propaganda is managed, shaping how advertising is managed, shaping our preferences, shaping 
way more than the average person realizes. And, you know, there are places in the world that are going to escape these changes for longer than other places. But, um, yeah, if we aren't able to develop metacognizance of wider uh, teleological information, if we're not able to solve the problem of myopic goal setting in these hybridized, capitalist-based AI hybrid systems, um, then we're probably going to run into something like the paperclip scenario. You know, whether that's, you know, making the numbers go up at all cost, whether that is you know, even like nation state actors have similar myopias where if their prime directive, their number one bottom line is the survival of their political sovereignty, then they can sacrifice like the earth itself in the name of this myopic goal that they are focused on. Um, because nation states, corporations don't have metacognizance in the way that human beings do where we can question our goals. Nation states don't do that. Big organizations don't have that capacity currently, right? So that problem has to be solved. Um, just as an example, Israel has the Samson op op uh, option, or if they're existentially threatened, they basically plan to nuke the earth <laughs> and eliminate human life, um, which, you know, makes sense in a kind of cold, calculated real politic perspective but i'd say that's clearly an instance of myopic goal setting uh, if nation states the interests of nation states are kind of evolutionarily determined then it is still not like in the best interest of that organic nation to kill all human beings even if their you know their ethnic stock was wiped from the earth because uh, they're related genetically to other human beings and in evolutionary terms, like their fitness is increased by those other nations still existing, even if their own doesn't. Um, so the issue of goal setting has to be addressed. So I said before, maybe there are ways of integrating organically with one another to set goals and generate this organizational metacognizance to solve the myopic goal setting problem. Maybe. Or maybe there's a way of using these computer tracking methods, AI systems, to bring about another kind of goal setting. You'd have to move beyond the logic of pure capitalism. Because as long as that fiduciary obligation to the shareholder is the, the prime directive, as long as like the bottom line of the capitalist uh, you know, owner class, as long as their interests alone are really being considered, this issue of myopic goal setting will continue. What you need, I think, is a, a teleology in these cybernetic behemoths that goes bottom up and top down in a way where the ultimate objectives of the corporation as a whole are determined partly by individual meaning making and purpose seeking of like bottom level employees of end users. And I think there are technologies for implementing that sort of thing. You know, when we think of workflow optimization, we're thinking of like the, the problem is being solved in terms of the bottom line of the corporation, right? But you could also have a kind of bottom line that in a weighted way inputs the preferences of uh, individual human beings at all scales. So rather than like AI being a means for optimizing teleological determinations from owners to their subjects, basically, um, you can have a system of teleological feedback where the goals of individuals in a system are informed by that system and the goals of the system are informed by individuals at the bottom or in the middle or at all uh, scales. And you have to have a way of weighting the influence of preferences according to a generalized utility function um, that is not subject to this myopia problem. And, you know, the, let me just make clearer, if I can, the myopia problem, because it obviously doesn't just apply to artificial intelligence. It applies to human goal setting as well. 
you know, the drug addict who only cares about having this given experience um, is willing to sacrifice their well-being uh, and move towards evil in order to satisfy a goal that they should probably be questioning, right? It's hard to question our goals. And when we're talking to one another, um, there's basically two ways to engage in conversation. It can be negotiation in terms of goals, in terms of setting teleology. Conversation can be negotiation where private interests are presumed at the outset, right? And negotiation makes sense the meaning of what's happening in a negotiation is intelligible because each actor kind of knows what they want at the outset. But that's not all conversations. Not all conversations are negotiable. If that's, a word. I know that's not a word, but it can also be a philosophical conversation where discussion of the nature of the good leads to goal setting. We also shouldn't necessarily assume that private interest ultimately is even a legitimate concept. Maybe there's no such thing as true private interest, right? Because you are part of the world um, and the world as your representation is part of you and you're kind of inseparable from the whole, right? So any kind of purely private interest and conceptions of purely private interest, I think, will have to be some kind of myopic goal setting. You know, like, do you question what you want out of life sufficiently? Probably not, right? You find the path of least resistance. You are subject to instincts that are often not good for you. Like, a lot of people have an instinct to avoid work because, you know, it's efficient in the evolutionary context of our ancestors to save your energy, don't expend too many calories, and then you won't have to consume calories. So work, you know, when you decide to work, it has to be for some, you know, tangible good. It has to be worth it. And so we decide not to work very often, even though food is abundant and we can obviously, you know, uh, work uh, as much as we would like to on any variety of task uh, without risking starvation. But these instincts determine how we set our goals in large part, um, sexual instincts about you know how we want to reproduce, what is good for us reproductively, and that's largely not a metacognizant process for people. Um, people in these communities probably to a greater extent than other communities but this, this problem of goal setting applies to AI. It applies to us. You know, what are your ultimate goals? Do you enter into larger social systems in a mode of negotiation or in a philosophical mode of uh, determination of the common good? You know, if imagine if you have people come together in good faith, assuming that there is a solution to how to work together to benefit everyone involved to the greatest extent possible. If you come together and work together in that way, there is less friction in getting the job done in principle. Um, to make that more concrete, European civilization outcompeted other civilizations partly because we were high trust. Other civilizations had to expend a lot of energy in um, protection against fraud, uh, deception, theft. You know, crime rates were very low in post uh, bubonic plague Europe. That's not just because of the plague and economic conditions that arose in the aftermath of the plague, it's also because of you know, centuries of execution of criminals um, under a, a pretty robust system of law. Um, European law obviously inherited the, the church's um, teachings on the relation of church and state, which were influenced by Roman law. And, you know, it's not that Chinese legal systems weren't sophisticated themselves, um, but I think that that legal philosophy was 
more emphasized in the West than in other places. That led to ultimately criminal justice <clears throat> that was a bit more extreme than in other places. It led to lower crime rates, higher trust. People cared about reputation. You know, your word was extremely important. Whereas in, even in like the Bible, you can kind of see the ethos of the Middle Eastern merchant where like, if I can get away with defrauding you, like, hey, you should have like watched your back. And that's the default. Um, in some parts of the world, that, that is just how it is. You know, when you get pulled over by a cop, they're expecting a bribe. This, like, it's not high trust societies. Europe traditionally has generated high trust societies through historical accident and its uh, legal system. Um, so that's one level of optimization of an economic system. You don't waste resources having to ensure all sorts of economic interactions because both parties just enter in in good faith. But they're still entering in in the mode of negotiation where they each assume their private interest at the outset. And my claim would be that if you could overcome psychological limitations and have people come together in the name of the common good and abandon this idea of private interest, which I do think is illusory, ultimately speaking, um, if you could have that, then you would have an even less, uh, you know, a less friction uh, impeded workflow. You would have a more frictionless economic activity if everyone was working together for the common good explicitly. That requires questioning your goals, entering into this so larger social system seeking for the common good, seeking for that generalized utility function. You know, this is obviously the way that uh, Christianity thinks about the will, your individual will. You can think about your individual benefit, your individual uh, interest as personally conceived, but Christianity will tell you that like, ultimately you don't know what's good for you. And the only true good will be conforming your will to the will of the body of Christ, the will of Christ, and enacting his will in your corporate structure as a, a member of the Christian community. That's, I mean, the concept of the corporation comes out of uh, that Christian concept. Corporation literally means body. You know, the, the church was the body of Christ. So corporate personhood uh, evolves out of Christian theological thinking and anthropological thinking, Christological thinking. Um, but what Christianity points to as a solution is a step beyond the kinds of integration that can happen in corporations or nation state actors where they are intrinsically limited in their metacognizance of their goal setting. They're prone to myopia in a number of ways. I hope I've made that case in a compelling way. Nation states, don't care about the purpose of consciousness. That's not within their purview, right? There are things that are important that nation states cannot address. Existential concerns, questions of deep meaning. Corporations can't address these things because they have to focus on the shareholder. They have to focus on the owner. That's just the way it is. And if they don't do those things, they're going to be outcompeted by a, a corporate structure that does. So I would say what you need is a corporate structure that has telic feedback, that has a capacity for metacognizance of goal setting, and a way of coming to the table, uh, or actually that's not the appropriate analogy, because coming to the table is like in terms of negotiation. We have to have a way of putting the table aside. Let's take the table you know, out from between us and actually meet in the middle and see what, what that common good is and what it resides in. That's what would be necessary. Uh, seems like a big ask, but the question is, if that is not done, if we don't generate virtuous AI human uh, cybernetic hybrid <laughs> superorganisms to compete on the world stage, then the corporate and state AI hybrid uh, superorganisms behemoths will just inherit the earth and we don't know what that looks like, you know, because no human intelligence is exercising foresight. 
to determine goals intelligently. The goals are being determined by the structure of the evolutionary game and the structure of capitalism. And we're going to get what we get out of that. We're rolling the dice and we'll see. So your choice basically is submit to your eventual AI hybrid human overlords, you know, submit to Amazon, submit to China style social credit and surveillance in perpetuity or integrate with others in a deeper sense than those technocratic systems can because we engage from the bottom up in metacognizance of our goal setting. If we are conscious of how we're setting our goals, we can align our goals in a way that in principle would allow for a more frictionless workflow, right? Um, in the logic of capitalism, you can only optimize that workflow so much because individuals in that system will make hedging bets trying to pr protect what they think of as their private interest. And so all of the work is not going to go into the common good. It can't. So if we think about that common good, question our private interests, and yeah, probably use some AI systems and computer tracking along the way to really integrate the system and get signals propagating in a way that facilitates those ultimate goals. If we do that, then maybe we can compete and we can, you know, transition into the robot age <laughs> in, in like a, a more humane way, something like that. And, you know, I, of course there's at the same time, the whole, why not just send us back to the dark ages option, the Kaczynski option. And the problem is uh, that's not really viable practically or morally. Uh, the implications are gruesome <laughs> of, of that kind of path forward. And most likely you're just going to, you know, get yourself killed. And yeah, I mean, it's the Luddite path is not very proactive. You know, it's like you can't really make choices about what other people do with the technology they have available. Um, so those are your options, right? Submit to the beast system as it exists and protect what you conceive to be your private gain, right? Because, okay, the beast system in some ways just has its origin in the financial system. The corporate capitalist structure is an outgrowth of the banking system, I would argue, ultimately. Rockefellers and Rothschilds and etc. are kind of behind it. And uh, their system has afforded you your private wealth. And you think about prote protecting that private wealth, but it was given to you by Mammon. <laughs> and if that's what you care about, rather than questioning that goal and looking for the common good and joining a larger body, if you have to concern yourself primarily with that private wealth, you are um, serving the beast, you are serving Mammon, and you're not serving God. You can only serve one or the other. You can't serve God and Mammon. Um, so you can serve the beast. That's one option. You can go Kaczynski mode, probably not advisable, or we can learn how to come together in an integral framework that is humanizing, that has bottom up and top down feedback where we clarify our interests, clarify our teleology philosophically, engage in self-reflection. The challenge there is moral, right? It's, well, it's technological as well, because you still have to solve those problems of how signals propagate through the network, how the network is structured. But what, what good faith philosophically motivated actors can do that corporations can't is escape this problem of myop myopic goal setting. It's kind of, it's baked into the cake in the way that corporations act, the way that states act. We can act in a different way. So I hope those options are clear. I hope you understand the kind of problematic that I'm describing here and our options as far as responding to it. Should you be concerned about the threat of AI? Absolutely. It is already dominating your life in ways that you're hardly conscious of. And it's determining our future in ways that no one can foresee. And that's not ideal. So 
you know, maybe we should think about other ways forward and how to intelligently respond to this. Thank you guys for listening. God bless.